Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum all and welcome to another episode of Conversation with the Author. I'm your host Abdul Hay. Alhamdulillah with the fadl of Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala we are able to have someone very interesting today, someone whose life is nothing but adventure. Um so without any further ado we will introduce um the the author the book that we're going to talk about today or rather the the, the author of the book is uh, John Butt and the the book is called uh, a talib's tale um so i welcome the author maulana uh, john but welcome to the show uh thank you very much for having me abdul hay barakallah fee for your time um I, I i think we should just just get to that because there's so much to cover in your book mashallah it's a book that i thoroughly enjoyed and the last time i read a book like that was um muhammad asad wrote to mecca I I think to start off the first question obviously your name and the title of the book will create a curiosity in the mind of our our listeners you have John Butt and then you have a Talib which is well, a Well yeah so how how does it how, can you explain the title and, and then we can perhaps move to your background it's probably explained a little bit in the book but my you know original english name was uh, John Butt Though uh as you uh may or may not know or your viewers and your listeners may or may not know but is also a very famous name in North India and North Pakistan Punjabi Kashmiri uh, Himachal there's lots of buts uh so that creates more confusion because there are only also English buts I'm actually an English but okay but uh you know obviously in uh that part of the world but you know it's you, it's considered to be butsap it's uh, kashmiri actually my generally in pakistan considered to be kashmiri in india can be anywhere from kashmir to uttarakhand there's lots of buts so uh it's uh, that creates another layer of confusion but as far as the uh the john is concerned that's my original english name and then of course when i uh, became muslim in uh, 1970 then oh they said oh you're john but so now you're john muhammad you know this was what the the mullah who uh, in, uh, inducted me into the uh, into uh, the islamic faith he uh, he uh, said well your 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 name is john so now you're john muhammad you know so uh that was how john muhammad came so you know i i really have two names one is john muhammad and one is uh john but can you ex- uh, explain how does a englishman you know living in england goes to a completely different culture how he becomes a hippie and then he goes to an environment that may be considered as some rough uh less compassionate and how how does this happen so if you can start from your childhood and to but well, it's very you know yeah well uh, the, the childhood is something that people can read about but you know as i grew up i had a lot of disillusionment from very being a very religious you know devout uh, christian catholic when i was very young there was a lot of questions about the christian faith you know about the trinity about the divinity of jesus about uh, you know m- Mary uh being the mother of Jesus of course that's fine but uh, then being the you know mother of the the mother of God you know that's what they uh, the Christians you know would have us believe and then you know the authenticity of the bible that we have, uh, currently have the infallibility of the pope So all these questions started coming into my mind. I was at a very uh, Catholic school, a very um, you know, very religious Catholic school run by Jesuit priests uh who were like strict, you know, uh very strict in, in the in the practice of the uh, Christian religion. So nobody had uh, answers to the questions that were appearing in my mind as I grew up. I think I've you know mentioned the main points. And then uh basically well you know going i'll i'll leave that I'll, i'll i'll answer that in a second how i got there but reading the quran for the first time i just said i had a, a friend at school and he'd served uh, in the uh, his father had served in north africa during the war you know with uh, 
Montgomery and uh, this Auchinleck particularly, these field marshals in the Second World War. And then uh, he had in his room at school, he had a little uh, shelf which was high up on the wall. I can still remember it in my mind's eye. And he had the Quran there, this uh, boy at school. I still am in touch with him, actually. And trying to repay the compliment, I would uh, say to him. Because he was the first person who lodged Islam in my brain. And I said, you know, what's this which is on your shelf? And he said, uh, you know, that's the real book. That's the real book. You know, all the books that uh, they're teaching us here at school, they're not the real thing. This is the real thing, you know. So I didn't really get, uh, you know, and then he showed me the Quran, you know. And then uh, I didn't really, so, you know, it just uh, it's, it made an impression more on me as the years go on, actually. But uh, I thought, wow, you know, because, you know, you have all sorts of ideas at school, you know. And then, so, you know, it was just one of those ideas which went through, but uh, the impression it had on me. Then the first time I read the Quran was uh, in, uh, in Peshawar in 1970, during Ramadan. So you get, you know, the, uh, the uh, you know, Ramazan, you know, reading the Quran in Ramazan. Everybody knows as a Muslim that reading the Quran during the rest of the year is one thing, but reading the Quran in Ramazan has another type of effect. Shahru Ramazan al-Azi unzila fi al-Quran. You know, it's the, it's the month in which the, the Quran was, you know, uh, to a certain extent revealed, you know? And then, uh, so that uh, had another effect. Then all the uh, answers to all the questions which I had had as a young boy growing up, they were answered. Uh, so, you know, I can't go into the details here, you know, but uh, I could do, but it'll take too much time. But you can read the book, you know, I have to leave something for reading of the book. Definitely. So, can so you... they were answered. So that was a natural thing, you know, that was a, that was a natural thing for me. Then as far as getting to Peshawar is concerned, look, if you were... If you knew, you're too young, you know, but I'm sure you've read history and you know, like about, you know, 67, 68, in 1967, the Beatles went to India. Okay, interesting. And Donovan in uh, 1960, sort of, uh, okay, I'm not sure the exact, but that was probably 68. Then, you know, everybody, you know, Timothy Leary, all the gurus of the uh, hippie movement. They were also going to uh, Richard Alpert, who became known as Ramdas, and this uh, Timothy Leary and Allen Ginsberg. They all went to uh, you know various places in the Himalayas, you know, and uh, that's also mentioned in the book. Uh, so you know, in 1968, when I left school. Like, you know, the only thing for us to do who were of a certain, you know, disposition and a certain mindset was to go to India. There was no uh, other option for us. And, you know, and, just, and if I can yeah. just, if I can just ask, why is, why India? What, what is well, you know, East, East, you know, India is the, uh, you know, is the, uh, the, uh, you know, symbol of uh, spiritual East, you know, I'm not, you know, because, you know, people are that, you know, they don't talk so much about Afghanistan, Pakistan, India. But India is just the East, you know, and spiritual enlightenment and spiritual fulfillment and something more than what you're getting in, uh, you know, the West, which is a materialistic type of uh, upbringing and a materialistic uh, career and, you know, something which is bound uh, by the uh, by the limitations of, uh, you know, the, uh, the, this uh, worldly life, you know. So something which is more, which is more meaningful. So the, it's, it's like a symbol. India is a symbol for uh, what is a meaningful life, you know, and a, a life of spirituality and a life of, uh, of meaning. And, and, and when you went to India as a hippie, how did the people receive you? And how, how did they... They, find they, were, they were used to it, you know, they were used to the people coming. They were, you know, because it was normal then, you know, and they were like Malangs, you know, they were like Malangs. They were like Sadhus. So in Afghanistan, they knew about Sadhus. In Pakistan, they knew about, sadhus, about Malangs, you know, in, in Afghanistan, you know, Malang was normal. Malang is like a Muslim version of a Sadhu. Okay. You know, looking a bit like you, you know, long hair and, you know, stuff like that, you know. And, uh, and uh, long hair and, you know, long beard. I remember one guy, 
he was actually a policeman. He, you know, some of these Englishmen who come, uh, Westerners who come to Peshawar, Bilkul Shekhandi, they look like big sheikhs, you know, because they got long hair and they got long beard, you know, and they've, they've got that uh, sort of look. So, so, so they, so, they really liked them and they were, they liked them actually. They got on very well with them actually, with the, uh, with these hippies. And, uh, is, is there, did they, did they like you, or the, the hippie movement? because you're a hippie and you had the idea of almost like free love or did they like you just because you look like uh, and well actually i never took to the uh, sort of free love type of aspect of hippieism uh you know that never attracted me my i was more i always say i was the spiritual type of hippie rather than the sensual type of hippie sure so uh, I wasn't really into the free love scene, you know, uh, as I mentioned in my book, you know, I did have my, uh, you know, relationships, uh, uh, you know, one in particular. And uh, I still uh, wish that, you know, sort of, you know, that uh, she might have continued the journey with me and, you know, also become Muslim. But uh, that was, you know, that was just normal, you know, that was, you know, you, uh, you know that was... Like, uh, not, I wasn't into this free love type of thing. You know, that was, you know, one relationship, you know, so, uh, like, um, but, uh, mm. yeah, so the free love aspect, no, then they, uh, they, they, obviously locals didn't like that so much, actually. So I think I, but the more, then they took to me more probably because they could see that this guy is not into that side of it, you know? Sure. But, uh, yeah, there were, of course, hippies who were, and probably some who were into both the, the sensual side of it and the spiritual side of it, and some who were more into the sensual side of free love, you know, hedonism, you know? Just, and, just, uh, sorry, uh, just to tap more into this, uh, this hippie way of life. Now, obviously, regardless of how you choose to be, if you're born in an environment where you have a certain lifestyle, certain let's say things are made easy how did you find it to go to an environment where just to get a milk is is, is almost like a journey so how did that sit well, i could do without as i go into in my book uh macrobiotic <laughs> macrobiotic you know this macrobiotic is the law of opposites sure. which is another thing which uh, struck a chord with me in the quran so use this, you know, the twin opposites, the polar opposites of creation, using that as a sp springboard to find Allah. So uh, this was, you know, also very key in my spiritual development. So as a macrobiotic, all I wanted to eat was actually brown rice. Okay. I just used to survive just on brown rice. And I still have the same type of brown rice I like. Uh, I, I eat it, you know, I eat to parties also. But uh, I still, uh, I ha I've always had a very simple diet. So I got out of that stage of consumerism, you know, of uh, worship of the consumerist society. I'd done my escaping, you know, in uh, the West, you know escaping from the clutches and the traps of western consumerism i had done that already so that wasn't any problem to me if i didn't have any you know the things that i needed or i didn't need any milk in fact i used to just have green tea is fine for me and you know there were yeah i just uh, i've always been if something is there it's fine if it's not there then you know i'm not, uh, not a problem sure well moving on now that you settled down, we, we have some sort of understanding how you settled down among the, the, the among the, the the society, among the communities. I from your book you mentioned that there was a number of discussion about Islam and about way of life from different character. But there was one particular person in the past in the month of Ramadan who assumed that you were fasting and he did a small action that kind of really pushed you. Can you can you talk about that and how important Yeah, well obviously, you know, some yeah, that was the uh, sort of catalyst which, uh, you know, actually changed me into a Muslim. And I was just sitting because I was, uh, you know, sitting in the bus. I wasn't actually fasting. Uh, and uh, because it was about the third day of Ramazan. And I just uh, wasn't, uh, you know, going to break the fast, you know, because I wasn't fasting. And But he came onto the bus and he thought because I looked like pretty poor, you know, like I was, you know, just hardly, hardly any uh, type of, hardly any uh, 
I, I had a knapsack, which my father had had uh, during the war. And uh, we'd, we'd used it as a, for a shoe brushing, uh, you know, in my home, my parents' home, we used it for putting uh, shoe brushes and shoe polish. And that was all I had. And that even that wasn't full. So, you know, I did look pretty uh, down and out, you know. And so uh, then uh, he, uh, he just came onto the bus because he saw that this guy is, and of course, you know, a Muslim to give somebody the wherewithal to break their fast is considered to be one of the most excellent actions that you can perform. Then uh, he just uh, thrust some pakoras and some dates into my hand. And he said, Roja Mataka. Yani, Roja Roja told him. So, you gotta break your fast, you know. If that. So, I, uh, I um, thank you very much. And thank you very much. And then, but, you know, then that just sort of, you know, that was an act in which he had accepted me wholly as a Muslim. And he'd also uh, performed a very, very Islamic act of giving me the wherewithal to break my fast. So I still re remember his face and I remember his smiling face and very genial and very, uh, you know. So, uh, you know, often you get angels sent by Almighty Allah in various guises. So this uh, guy was in fact uh, an angel, I think, sent in the guise of like gentlemen in order to, uh, you know, ensure my induction into the, uh, into the Islamic faith. Now, do you think it's that little action that, because you do make it clear that there's, there's a lot of conversation among different people, and that they, they, they didn't convince you so much of Islam, and you know, it was kind of passing discussion, but this little action. So, do you think it was the action of the Muslim there that, that attracted you to Islam, or was it a bit of a theological and uh, no, no, yeah, there was, as I said, look, any discovery in life <clears throat> is not uh, in one second. The discovery happens in one second, but there's a lot of groundwork that has uh, gone on before that discovery. It doesn't happen to me or you, you know. Uh, you or me is not going to shout Eureka in the bath, you know, like uh, Pythagoras did. But uh, this, uh, because he'd been thinking about that matter for years and years and years and years. That's why he shouted uh, Eureka, you know, in the bath. But um, uh, so it just happens in an instant, the discovery, but there's a lot of groundwork. So, yeah, uh, but I hadn't read the Quran then. Actually. I hadn't read the Quran. Well, that, that, leads us, that leads us to nicely to our next question. You mentioned certain Sheikh Al Quran and his, his, his influence on you and his explanation of the Quran that kind of lightened you. Can you talk a bit about that? And, and what, yeah, but that was after I became Muslim. Sheikh Al Quran was uh, Molana Muhammad Tahir in uh, Panjshir village, pa sorry, Panjshir village, uh, in Panjshir village in uh, near Swabi, in uh, near Peshawar. So he was a great scholar of Islam. So what he did. I mean, I'll just mention, because the things I mentioned earlier about the questions that had uh, uh, risen in my mind about uh, Christianity, the infallibility of the Pope and the divinity of Jesus and the Trinity instead of the Tawheed, the unity and all these things, which had, uh, you know, cropped up in my mind. So uh, I knew, I mean, I, by that time, by the time I went to Panjshir and studied with uh, Molana Muhammad Tiger, Sheikh of Quran, he, uh, I had, you know, already studied the Quran quite a lot, actually. In that three years, a Talib can do quite a lot, you know. Sure. I think he jumped a bit, you know, from me being a hippie into me to being a sort of Talib, you know, I became a Talib. You know? I became a real student of Islam, you know, really carrying my books every day to the uh, next door village and uh, studying Islam seriously, you know? Well, let's move on to that then, since I missed it. I mean, this will be... Yeah, you missed that. So, uh, yeah, then, you know, able... I, oh. I had already been a Talib for about three years by the time I went to Panjshir village. Well, can you so describe I knew that? about Surah Ali Imran, I, I knew about the uh, Monazira, the debate that takes place in uh, Surah Ali Imran between the Christians and the, uh, the Muslims of Najran. No, sorry, the, the Muslims of Medina and the Christians of Najran. And uh, then I knew that uh, Surah Ali Imran 
that in Surah Baqarah, then the Almighty Allah is talking mainly to the Jews, but in Surah, Surah Al Imran, uh, Almighty Allah is talking mainly to the Christians. So I uh, I knew about that. So when I went to Panjshir, I said to uh, I said to Sheikh Al Quran, Maulana Muhammad Tahir, may Allah bless his soul, that uh, this uh, oh uh, Maulana Sab, can you please uh, make a big effort with uh, Surah Al Imran? In your dars, he used to. We have a thing amongst the Pashtuns, and it's called Dora Tul Quran. We have Dora Hadith and Dora Quran. So Dora Dora Hadith is what they do in madrasas. You know, there's uh, there's uh, Chota Dora and Bara Dora. So that's what we do in Indian madrasas, Indian and Pakistani madrasas. In the second year, second final year of your madrasa study, you do Mishka, and that's considered to be a small Dora of the Hadith. And then, uh, and then it's like a study tour of the hadith, Dora. And then uh, this, uh, in the final year, you do the Dora hadith, which is uh, uh, this um, Sahai Sitta, the, five, the six authentic collections of uh, hadith. So uh, I, he, he, what we used to do, and Mullah the Sheikh of Quran introduced it amongst the Pashtuns, was uh, Dora, the Quran Dora, Dora to Quran was uh, the, uh, the, the study of the Quran during Ramazan. So it was like the whole of Ramazan, you're sitting all day during the day and you're, you're, you're listening to Quran lecture from the Shafu Quran. I haven't come across this in anywhere else except amongst the Pashtu. And he was the one who introduced it very much. In Ramazan, everybody will, because the madrasas are off during Ramazan, and then they'll go and do uh, this Dora uh, Quran. So this, um, so I said to him, please uh, concentrate a lot on Ali Imran because I want to go to uh, Britain and I want to, you know, uh, explain Islam to uh, and preach Islam amongst Christians. And so, uh, because they're my nation. And so I should, uh, I should know very well. So, and he always, every year until he died, he used to mention that, that all oh, this Englishman came to me and said, oh, please go into Surah Ali Imran in great detail because I have to, you know, this will, this will, be, uh, this will stand me in good stead for my preaching Islam amongst the Christians, uh, amongst Christians. So that was, uh, that, that was sort of the big, uh, yeah, no, he uh, passed away in 1986. But uh, Alhamdulillah, I have one uh, recording, full recording of the whole of Quran uh, done by him. Uh, MashaAllah. Um just uh, just due to time moving on um i mean at this point you you obviously been a talib for you say three years and plus and you study with some of the sheikhs of, of of the area now there this is a kind of the talib's lifestyle but there in terms of politically you mentioned a lot that there was so much going on there was so much conflict there's so much kind of fighting within different tribes and all that. Now, how do you then navigate? How did you rather navigate through? Well, I did and you know, I have to read the book, but I had, you know, obviously because I was studying Quran, so I got involved with people who were considered to be uh, sort of heretics, you know, because, you know, there were a lot of traditional Muslims and then there were the reformists, you know, who wanted to, you know, wanted to purify Islam, you know, as far as uh, Tawheed and Sunnah was concerned. And, you know, so uh, I was very much attached to the people, you know, because they were serious about studying the Quran. So, you know, I wasn't particularly, you know, interested in getting involved in sectarianism, but I was in interested in doing uh, serious study. And so the people I got involved with were sort of uh, their, their, you know, um, philosophy, you know, uh, they sort of flew in the face of traditional Islam, uh, in amongst the Pashtuns, so there was some conflict, and I also got involved in that, but better to read the book, you know, because I was sort of, you know, and then they, you know, Pashtuns, they make a big thing, oh, you know, if there's an Englishman, you know, oh, you know, then he's their agent, and he's their, you know, he's their, the, he's, the, you know, the, 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 it's the English plot to undermine Islam sort of thing, you know, and so, you know, they, they start this type of, it's actually uh, quite common throughout the Muslim world, that type of uh, propaganda. How, that, that's, uh, that's, I, I understand that, but how do you then, being an Englishman, new to Islam, um, you know, you're looking for spirituality, but, and then you go to a group of people who, who, who has that. 
or what you, you know but yet there is another side to them there's always fighting in and and you know uh, well, yeah, yeah, no, how, how, how did you feel inside I, I think the audience will be interested to know how did you say well you know what i'm gonna leave what they do and i'm going to concert how did you find because all of them well, are... i did I, eventually when i got out of various spells of captivity and jail and one thing and another then i uh, i um i went to madrasa you know i went to india which is you know in that you know, the Pashtuns have a very special relationship with Dioband. Okay. They, uh, you know, Dioband is for them, you know, it's like, I don't know, somebody in the back going to Oxford or Cambridge, you know, and, you know, like it's, you know, you have a, a dream of uh, spires and, you know, very, you know, academic type of atmosphere. So, but for Pashtuns, I, you know, especially, but, you know, all the people, a lot of people, Bengalis and, you know, everybody and everybody in the, you know, everybody from Afghanistan, Nepal, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Burma even, India, of course, you know, they aspire to Dioban. But the thing is about, you know, that some other people in uh, other parts of the subcontinent, then they, you know, some of them might aspire to other places, centers of learning because of their particular, you know, mentality or their particular, particular you know, creed, which they, um, ascribed to, but Pashtuns are 100% Deobandi. So uh, you, you won't find, I think, any uh, nation. And I think that's a big problem of the Pashtuns, actually, now that all these, they have all these problems of conflict and stuff, you know, that they are cut off from their, the source of their learning. And, uh, and you know, so, so I think that's a little, that's, um, you know, one problem of, you know, the problem, the Pushkin problem, as someone has called it, or the Pushkin question, as one uh, colleague of mine uh, has put it in a book, a very good book called The Pushkin Question, uh, about, you know, I think that's one of their main problems, is that, uh, you know, uh, you know, with the partition, and uh, with the partition of India, then the, the Pushkins have been cut off. Uh, from 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 Doban, but then also other aspects of uh, of uh, you know Indian life, which uh, you know were key in the Pashtun uh, type of uh, psyche, as far as their history is concerned. If you look at any, you know, in the 1980s, people were there who could remember pre-partition days, and I can remember one uh, very you know he was like a very poor chap. He used to come around to my hotel in the 1980s in India in Delhi. And he used to do a massage. He used to say, massage, good massage, you know, malish kya karte hai. So then, uh, then he said, you know, because people used to think I was Pashtun. You know, and still, you know, people think I'm Pashtun, you know, because, you know, I've spent so much uh, time amongst the Pashtuns. But that's the subtitle of my book is also Pashtun Englishman. So he used to say, oh, Khan Sap, you know, you, when you guys were ruling, because, you know, they were everywhere, there was Pashtun kingdoms in North India. You know, the Nawab of Patodi, um, this, uh, who's, you know, what's his name, Saif Ali Khan, the actor Saif Ali Khan, and uh, whose uh, mother, of course, is uh, a famous Bengali actress, and uh, father was uh, Mansur Ali Khan, who was the captain of the cricket, uh, Indian cricket team. So the Pashtuns, you know, these people started off as adventurers, Pashtun adventurers because they were adventurers, the Pashtuns. They were people, you know, they were a type of, uh, type of, uh, you know, not militant, not so not exactly the word. The, uh, they were a type of martial people. And they, uh, you know, used to go to India, you know, for adventure. So the, uh, the Nawabate of Bhopal, for instance, in the center of India was a big Nawabate. And this, uh, the, who used to be the, uh, the chairman of the Pakistan Cricket Board, Shah Yar Khan, he was from that uh, family. And uh, they, these people started off as Pashtun adventurers who went to India in order to make a fortune, set up a kingdom, you know, make money, <laughs> whatever, you know, uh, you know, in order to do business, uh, uh, have adventure, and maybe they end up setting up a kingdom. And, you know, the Mughals liked them, the British liked them. So there's, they were, these weren't one, these were dozens of Nawabes, you know, the, and they were all Pashtuns. 
who just hailed from the Pashtun lands. Interesting. So this was very <clears throat> important part of the Pashtun psyche, you know. So this, uh, yeah, this, uh, you know, so I think the problem is the Pashtuns, they're looking for adventure, but they don't have anywhere to, you know, <laughs> anywhere to, uh, you know, exercise this uh, urge that they have for adventure. So they end up uh, doing, uh, you know, jihad amongst themselves sort of thing. Because sure. they haven't got any, they haven't got any outlet. Yeah. Mm. Returning back to Devon, I mean, when you went there, you, you did describe it and they did welcome you and the, the, the Mulanas, they were the teachers, they kind of open you know, and you also got some funding from the government. I think it was- a When, 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 when you were in the madrasa, Devon, you got some funding. Oh yeah, I got some funding from the Indian government. Yeah. From, from the, the Indian in government. Yeah, look, I, look at this. I mean, you know, I need it. I was doing cross-border trade. And you know, okay, it was, you know, one problem with this, it was <laughs> fine. I was doing Atar and, you know, Jain Namaz and books. And uh, because, you know, if you know which books are published in Pakistan and not published in India and which books are published in India and not in Pakistan, you can do good book uh, trade also. And, you know, a lot of things in those days, there was a lot of foreign goods which were in Pakistan, which weren't in India. You couldn't get any polyester cloth in India. I used to come to Amritsar from Lahore and I used to have what we used to call mufflers. They were, I think, Japanese made. And I used to just have them on my arm. And these Sardajis, these Sikhs used to pick, them. you know, in 40 minutes, I would have sold dozens of uh, these mufflers, you know, at a good profit. And I used to take uh, pan from India to Pakistan. And this, uh, you know, for he would see me, the pan seller in Lahore would see me from a long way off. Oh, John Muhammad, thank you. I'm so glad you came. You know, I've really run out of pan here, you know. And so I was, you know, doing cross-border trade. And I was, so first of all, you get a bit greedy, you know, because you think, oh, I can make more and more money. And then uh, you get also, uh, and it was taking up my time. I, first of all, my teachers in Deoband said, oh, it's mashallah, mashallah, Imam Abu Hanifa, I'm, uh, but uh, that was, you know, but, uh, but then they, you know, because they used to say to me, where are you? I sometimes I don't see you for two or three days, John Muhammad. Where are you? I say, oh, Lord, I do some business, you know. And then they used to encourage it, but they used to say, that's a very good way of supporting yourself when you're studying. But uh, at the same time, it takes up time, you know, you miss your classes. And so, uh, and also then I was getting greedy. And once I was nearly arrested at this uh, border, you know, actually by the Indian, uh, Indian uh, border customs authorities, border authorities. And they actually said to me that you're making a fool of us by doing all, you know, by carrying all this, you know, which was, you know, basically contraband. I mean, you know, it was smuggled goods. I mean, it was very innocent items, but still it's smuggling. And so uh, I, uh, I thought, you know, I, I really, I thought it would be such a bad for Joban if I'm arrested and it will give Joban a bad name. Because I'll tell you one thing, and somebody mentioned me to me recently, Zafar al-Islam Khan, may Allah lengthen his life. He's the elder son of Mawlana Wahiduddin Khan. He said, you know, you won't find one madrasa student in India who's been accused of any crime. He said, I've never heard of a single mother as a student, and there's hundreds of thousands of mothers as a students in India. They are so law abiding people, you know, so law abiding people. Now, and so, yeah, I, I thought, you know, Joe Bund will get a bad name if I'm arrested. So I applied for a scholarship to the Indian government, and they said, uh, Oh, Joe Bund, you're studying in Joe Bund, and this uh, is such a we're very happy to hear that. And, uh, we are pleased. I went to the ICCR, the Indian Council of Cultural Relations, and they said, yes, that's very fine, but you have to uh, give an application through your own country. So I took the opportunity to go and see my parents in uh, England, and I went to the High Commission in uh, London of uh, India, and I applied for a scholarship at Durban, and it just went through like absolute, uh, you know, like uh, it went through like a dream. And so I got a 400, 500 rupee scholarship per a month, which was ample for me to study at Yovand. Yeah, so, yeah. I take us through your meeting with different ulema, different thinkers. Well, uh, let and, me, uh, and, you, know, I just, you know, I don't know if you know about in so 1981, you know, I was a very uh, model student at Yovand, you know? 
and very hardworking, conscientious, you know, very much uh, in love with Deoband and very much, uh, uh, you know, with my Islamic study. Then I, uh, you know, in 19, about 1981, this, uh, you know, latent uh, schism, which there is in the Deobandi thought, you know, the sort of Molana uh, Qasim Nanutwi, Molana Ashraf Ali Tanvi type of mentality on one side and the Sheikh Al Hind, Molana Hossein Ahmad Madani type of uh, mentality on the other side. So up till now, they coexisted, you know, this, uh, the Sheikh al Hind type of approach, which was, you know, you know, vehemently anti-British and uh, then uh, also, you know, type of, you know, okay, you know, even some uh, type of, uh, until 1920, also having recourse to, uh, you know, violent means in order to dislodge the British from India. And I go into this in the, uh, but you know, that was that type of, whereas, uh, you know, in, uh, in other religious movements, they also have this uh, type of schism, you know, and there was the administration of Darul and Yoban that, you know, we're not involved in politics, you know, okay, you know, we want to, uh, Yoban was set up in order to uh, create a fortress of Islam, uh, uh, Islamic learning in which, uh, you know, British ideas would not infiltrate. But uh, they had a different approach, you know, and actually there was always that uh, type of, uh, you know, latent tension between the administration of Darulim Dioban, which was strictly stick to your studies, don't get involved in politics, and the Sheikh Al-Hind approach, which was, uh, you know, you have to be uh, more political. And uh, so uh, there was always that. So this came to a head in 1981. Uh, actually, this, uh, and there was uh, like a, a rebellion against the administration of Darul Ulum Dioband, which at that time was in the hands, had been for the last 50 years in the hands of Qari Mahmud Tayyip, who was the grandson of uh, Molana Nanuti, who was the founder of Darul Ulum Dioband. So he was a direct connection with the actual establishment of Darul Ulum Dioband. And so was Sheikh Al Hind, because you know, when uh, Darul Ulum started, it was Molana Qasim Nanuti teaching Sheikh Al Hind, uh, Molana Mahmud Al Hassan. So, uh, you know, the, uh, both uh, strands of Diobandi thought had this uh, connection with the actual foundation of Darwin Diobandi. But I, yeah. Now, you as someone outsider who then become an insider, and also with a hippie background, and I have to bring this up, did, do you think your hippism or hippie kind of philosophy somewhat influenced which side of the camp you belong to? Where the Sufi camp? No, Andre, I wouldn't say that. Well, I mean, yeah, I was on the Sufi, Ashraf uh, Ali Tani. You know, I'm still, uh, you know, I'm one of the few scholars who has, you know, this is Molana Ashraf Ali Tani's full tafsir, Bayan al Quran. And, you know, I set store by it. But it's somebody at Yoban said to me that uh, Bayan al Quran to me is the absolute, uh, you know, the, 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 the top tafsir in any language. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's quite difficult to read. Even scholars have difficulty reading this. A very eminent scholar in the United Kingdom, I said, oh, I like Quran, my own Quran is my favorite type series. He said, yes, but it's very difficult to actually, you know, plow through. And I think that's part of its attraction, actually, that, you know, you feel you're, you're really, it's a challenge to actually read it. One uh, a contemporary of mine at Darulim Dioband, I, I said, oh, my Quran should be translated into English. And he said, yeah, but let's translate it into Urdu first. You know, he was being, uh, oh, you know, he was being tongue in cheek, you know, <laughs> it's like, you know, it's Urdu, it's so sakil, so difficult that actually, you know, it needs to be a uh, readable uh, Urdu. But anyway, so I was very much in that camp. I don't know whether it was my hippie background, but that was just my disposition. You know, I was in the, in the Molana Ashraf Ali Tanvi. And Molana Ashraf Ali Tanvi, Qari Tayyip was a uh, disciple and a Khalifa of Molana Tanvi as well as being the grandson of... But the thing which influenced me more was that my reading of hadith is that you are always loyal to the administration. You know, you're always loyal to the administration. If the administration does something wrong, you criticize them. But 
you don't uh, resort to violent means to, uh, you know, for, uh, and rebel against any administration, whether it be a government of a country or the, uh, or the uh, administration of a madrasa, even more probably the administration. So I was loyal to Karite. So as a result, when the students and the, uh, the you know, the, uh, took over the, uh, by violently, violently, they took over the uh, madrasa, then uh, the, my room was, of course, ransacked and all my books were considered to be, you know, this Englishman who'd, uh, who'd uh, you know, decided with the uh, administration, you know, loyal, loyalists to the administration, his books, you know, his Islamic books and everything are, Fair game, So uh, this, uh, so then you know, this was a very disillusioning experience for me. Very no. disillusioning. No. So I had my hippie background to fall back on. No, and and then I also had Molana we did in Khan to fall back on. It's, it's that's, that's, that's the next so, question. So this is what I when how I met Molana we did in Khan, and Mol then I uh, and then you know then a lot of his thought you know, struck a chord with me. And, you know, so that was really, after that, you know, the, uh, I was really going through the motions, to tell you the truth, as far as study at Doban was concerned, which is still a source of regret for me, that, you know, my, uh, that my final two years in studying Hadith were not uh, as fruitful as they should have been. And I've had to make up for that and I, afterwards, but I haven't probably done a, a terribly good job, but I've done my best. But um, yeah, so Maulana Widudin Khan was the one who uh, tidied me over that crisis. It wasn't, I mean, a crisis of faith or anything like that, but it was a big disillusionment with Deoband, with the uh, people who had taken over, you know, not with the uh, Tanui uh, Maulana Nanotri group because they were exiled. And they were they then set up a rival Darulum next to the old Darulum. They sent up their own Darulum, which they called Darulum Wakaf. But this, uh, what I saw as greed for power, uh, and uh, on the part of the people who had rebelled against the administration, this uh, disillusioned me in a big way. Now coming back to. Mulana Wahidullah Khan. Now I, I Wahiduddin Khan. Wahiduddin Khan, my apology. Wahiduddin Khan. You do spend a lot of time talking about him, praising him. Now I also Yeah, I praise him and I also criticize him. Yeah. I don't I, I don't praise people just you know, I uh, if there's something that I don't agree with, then I say I don't agree with that, you know. Would you would you then consider knowing how the the Mulana is or was rather he died um would you consider him a muslim hippie whereby he's and i, I, I let me explain I would, I, I would use that word about myself probably but not about him let, let me explain because he obviously has certain views certain ideas and certain he, his his dawa what i understood and correct me if i'm wrong is is central his central his focal point is about love and spreading love and you know all this kind of stuff which is, is, is nothing wrong with it um but it seems to me that and, and from my reading of of, of Mo, the, the molana that it transcend it goes behind beyond what the sharia allows love to be how he defines it so you know he talks about so much that where there shouldn't be love it comes out to, that he's talking about that. would you then say this is a a hippie characteristic a well for, if, if if you do consider that to be a hippie characteristic that would be a plus point as far as i'm concerned you know because uh the uh, actual the name of my book the first uh, name that penguin india gave to my book was hippie imam so uh you know that was describing me so uh i've sort of you know uh you know, outgrown hippism. I don't need uh, hippism anymore. You know, as a uh, as a philosophy or anything like that. I've you know totally. Uh, you know, I'm uh, very comfortable with uh, you know what uh, Islam, the Quranic uh, attitude, and uh, Quranic uh, perspective on life, uh, Quranic thought, Quranic uh, characteristics. You know, I'm not uh, don't need to look anywhere else for uh, you know for my uh, type of inspiration. 
But uh, I, I, I don't see anything wrong with that. So, you know, I mean, you know, it's just my background. But I mean, I never thought of him like that. But as far as, you know, peace is concerned, I, if you mean peace, I mean, I think he more is a standard bearer of peace than of love, you know, than of love in the hippie sense. But uh, I think, um, yeah, peace, I think absolutely, because I, I totally am an Islamic pacifist, totally. Mo moving on, uh, Maulana Saab. Now, you, you, you had a, a, a bright uh, a career in journalism, and, and there was one particular part when you used to work for the postal service, postal, postal service sorry, the BBC. Yeah. When you used to work for the BBC, um, you, you became a storyteller, essentially. Yeah, absolutely. That, that, that inspired a lot of people. Uh, it's a form of entertainment. Now, to wrap things up, and I just got a few more questions after that. Can you tell how does Maulana John, uh, John who, who was again, just to, re re you know, recap, uh, an Englishman, a hippie, becomes a, a Talib and then becomes a Maulana, then becomes a storyteller? And how, how well, does... that's also very natural. I mean, uh, Islam is Ahsan al Qasas. Islam is a lot of stories. So Islam is, you know, as all my teachers used to say, that it's the Dalail al aqliya which is, you know, scientific proofs about the existence of Allah. And then there is uh, Dalail al naqliya which is uh, the um, historical proofs. And the historical proofs are all stories. And there's two types of stories in the Quran. One is historical stories, one is allegorical stories, you know. Uh, you know that uh, you know one of them you know that like there's a, the story in Surah Qaf about two men who were one of uh, whom had lots of gardens and the other person uh, who had nothing you know so that sounds like an allegorical story you know which is you know not uh, particularly historical not necessarily but a parable as you know like there are lots of parables in the Injil also so, uh, you know, there's two types of stories. So in, uh, but the, the allegorical type of story, you know, reflects reality. So that's the type of stories that we used to have. It's absolutely Quranic, I don't think. And I mean, the greatest book of actual stories, which is a bit denigrated by the ulama, is the al fulayla wa Laylatun. The Thousand and One Nights of, uh, you know, of, uh, no one knows who wrote it, but Queen Shehzadeh who is you know, the most famous storyteller in the whole of history, uh, you know, and uh, she told the Thousand and One Nights to her husband, King Shahriyar. The stories are very meaningful, very meaningful. And that is something which has been underestimated up till now. It's something that Orientalists have picked up on a bit, but the Muslim ulama have sort of frown, frowned on the Thousand and One Nights because a lot of the tales are very racy and this and that, you know. So, uh, but they have a lot of meaning, a lot, a lot of meaning. I, I, I have a four volume translation of it. Yeah. yeah. I, um, I hope Richard Burton's translation. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, it has to be Richard Burton. Yes. Because I'll tell you, one person came to me at Joband, and it was, uh, I mean, I think a compliment. And he said to me, oh, you know, he was an old hippie friend of mine. And he said, oh, John Butt, you're like a modern Richard Burton. And I didn't even know who Richard Burton was. I thought he met the actress who was married to Elizabeth Taylor. And I thought, oh, whatever, you know, I don't see the resemblance between myself and Richard Burton, the Shakespearean actor. <coughs> and uh, he said, no, I mean, Sir Richard Burton, you know, the Orientals. So, yeah, of course, you know, as far as, from, uh, you know, he, uh, he, was, he was a pure Orientalist. But his scholarship, his scholarship is without peer. So... How did the, the, the society receive you as a storyteller? Uh, you know, you yeah, they, they treated me fine as that. They treated me fine as that. They loved that. And they love it. You know, they loved it. It's, uh, you know, it was from the, you know, the ordinary Afghan. Everybody loves the, 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 the story. I, I, I've still been doing it until the 2020. This is what I did for 30 years was uh, storytelling through radio, through radio drama in Afghanistan. And uh, everybody, you know, has loved that. Not and not just uh, you know Afghans love it, um, but you know Kofi Annan. I have a quote from Kofi Annan about particularly about the soap opera that I ran in Afghanistan. 
and which I can't, uh, I probably got it to uh, hand. Uh, but uh, you know what he said, uh, somebody posted it on Facebook the other day, that he said, you know, this was the perfect example of educating people through entertainment. And uh, then actually I was, uh, which, uh, you, know, I, it's, uh, you know, I uh, mentioned it actually to the Queen, actually, when I met her in, uh, I was, you know, invited because I was the head of a, BB, a big BBC, you know, project. So when the Queen came to uh, Pakistan in 1998, I was invited by the High Commission to, uh, you know, attend the reception because I was a, you know, it was, a, you know, a big, big project of the BBC. This, uh, this, uh, the Archers for Afghanistan, it was called, you know, the Archers, it's, it's like uh, Radio 4 soap opera. And then I don't know why, you know, looking at my Islamic appearance and my topi and my looking English, you know, the Queen wasn't stopping to talk to anybody, but she talked to me because maybe it was the way I look, you know. And then uh, looking English and also looking uh, uh, Muslim. So then uh, she said, she said to me, where do you live? And I said, I live in Peshawar, ma'am. She said, what do you do there? And you know, this her tone of voice and her actual words I can remember. And you know, she said, what do you do there? And I said, I uh, run a uh, radio drama for, Af for Afghans. Uh, and it's, uh, and it's like, an, I, I just didn't find the words I wanted to explain quickly to her. So I said, it's like an Archers for Afghanistan, if you can, if you can, uh, if you can imagine. And then she said, no, I can't imagine that. Tell me about it. So this is her tone of voice and her actual words. And then she said, I said, well, it's like, you know, it's like a radio drama and we've got stories which are explaining to Afghans, uh, you know, how you can improve your lives and how you can lead a better life. And then she just said, I think that's fantastic. And then she, uh, she walked off, you know, and she was telling everybody, have you heard about what this, the, she said the BBC, because I must have put the BBC in there somewhere. Have you heard what the BBC is doing in Afghanistan? And people were coming to me and saying, you made quite a big impression with her, didn't you? With, uh, with the Queen. So, I mean, everybody from, you know, the ordinary Afghan on the streets to, uh, you know, the Queen of England and Kofi Annan, they absolutely love the Archers for Afghanistan. Well, unfortunately, uh, Maulana Saab, this is the end of our discussion. I mean, it's been a fruitful one. Your book has been, like I said at the beginning, an exciting one. To see someone develop from something to completely opposite is, is certainly a, 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 a enlightening experience. Um, so... Just to end, inshallah, I mean, we, I, first, I, I say Jazakumullah khairan for, for your time and for accepting our invitation and, share, and, and sharing your experience with uh, ILS and this audience. Um, inshallah, I hope to see everyone uh, next episode. Um, please visit the website www.islamicliteracysociety.com. Um, on that note, Jazakumullah everyone for, for watching and, and supporting us. والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته